And that's right. I'd blow up the pipes. I'd blow up the refi. I'd blow up every single inch. There would be nothing left. And you know what? You'll get Exxon to come in there in two months. You ever see these guys, how good they are, the great oil companies? They'll rebuild that sucker brand new. It'll be beautiful. And I'd ring it, and I'd take the oil. That was President, then candidate Trump's strategy for taking out America's enemies back in 2015. ISIS is still a player in the region, so despite all the bombing, he never achieved that goal. But at least he was honest about his intentions, taking the oil. And to be fair to Trump, bombing the stuff out of people is a promise he's managed to keep. There's been a disturbing rise in civilian casualties in Afghanistan since the Trump administration lifted certain restrictions on coalition airstrikes. A report out of Brown University today found in just 2019 alone, US coalition and Afghan Air Force airstrikes killed 700 civilians. That's more than any year since 2001 when the war began. That's a 330% increase in civilian deaths from 2016. In fact, the report suggests the Afghan military is ramping up attacks on their own civilians to later use as a bargaining chip in negotiations, as the US kind of did before the Taliban talks. On Friday, I talked about Obama's drone strikes, Barack Obama's drone strikes, the bloodshed they caused, and his recent apologetics trying to rationalize them post-mortem. And yet there's this annoying narrative that Trump is somehow less hawkish, has less blood on his hands overseas than Obama did. And that's just not the case. Often when Trump pretends to end a war, it's not exactly as advertised. We learned last week, for example, President Trump had ordered troops out of Somalia and Senator Rand Paul thanked him for bringing those soldiers home. Except, reality check, they're not coming home. Many of them will be redeployed into Kenya, which, as Donald Trump and Republicans reminded us time and again in 2008, is very much not part of the US. Trump did the same in Syria. Lots of noise about pulling out troops last year, only to move them to Iraq and then send more US troops back into Syria this September. But really, there's a rather cynical method to this madness. There is. A White House official told CNN the goal was to set so many fires abroad it'll be hard for the Biden administration to put them out come January. But how much blood is the Trump administration spilling along the way? And are Americans even paying attention? I'm joined now by Nita Crawford. She's a professor and the chair of the political science department at Boston University and author of today's Brown University report on civilian casualties. And I'm also joined by Stephen Miles, executive director for Win Without War, a progressive activist group. Thank you both for joining me on the show. Nita, let me start with you. You found that the US and allied forces killed more civilians in Afghanistan last year than any other year in this 19-year war, and largely because restrictions on carrying out those strikes were loosened. 2019 was also the year that we killed more civilians than the Taliban. That will come as a shock to a lot of Americans, to a lot of our viewers. Did those numbers surprise you? Well, no, because they've been gradually ratcheting up. And in 2017, when the United States decided that it would loosen the rules of engagement, what happened was, uh, the number of strikes went up and the amount of ordnance went up, 2017, 2018, 2019. And all of this is in the run-up toward the negotiations that the United States wanted to conclude with the Taliban. So it's no surprise to me that by 2019, the number of civilians killed was uh, greatly increased. Yeah. And what kind of restrictions were lifted, Nita? You mentioned the rules of engagement. How did it become easier to bomb people? Well, from 2008, 9, 10, the United States realized in that period that when it killed civilians, it was actually increasing resistance among the Afghan civilians. They weren't making friends. Yeah. They were making enemies. And they restricted the airstrikes so that you couldn't uh, bomb unless, for instance, U.S. troops were at risk or unless they had uh, a line of sight or or um, the target was clearly identified. And in 2017, when Mattis said that they were lifting the rules of engagement, loosening them, he meant that uh, you didn't necessarily have to uh, have such tight restrictions, that US forces did not have to be at risk, for example. And then that allows a greater number yeah. of strikes and more ordnance. Yeah. 
So let me bring in Stephen. One thing that gets lost in these conversations is perspective. It's a lot of numbers of dead and numbers of strikes and stats. Uh, you, Stephen, at the start of the year, you tweeted that the US dropped 7,423 bombs in Afghanistan, and you actually used 7,423 bomb emojis to show us what that looks like. I mean, is that part of why we don't see public outrage over the deaths the US and its allies are causing abroad? We're just too detached from it all. It's all just a bunch of numbers. Yeah, I think we have lost a lot of perspective. I think it is very, very difficult to remember that we are at war in countries that we have been at war in for a very long time. And our media, for a large part, has done a terrible job of helping remind us of the consequences of that. That aside, the American public's actually been against these wars for a very long time. You know, Donald Trump, the reason he talks incessantly about how he's ending these wars, the reason that we've seen candidate after candidate running on a platform of ending these wars is because they remain unpopular. The problem is that the consequences are largely out of view from the American public. But the reality, uh, as, as Nita was just saying, is they're not out of view, obviously, of the people on the receiving end of these bombs. The reality of these, of, of these wars are deadly. They have devastating consequences. And they've been an abject failure. Yeah. Indeed, an abject failure. And, and Nita, you highlight an interesting moment in the report. Uh, General Stanley McChrystal, in his memoir, writes that following a 2007 NATO airstrike that killed half a dozen Afghan civilians, he told his team, uh, what is it we don't understand? We're going to lose this war if we don't stop killing civilians. Is that why we've effectively lost this 19-year-old war? Because we can't, we won't stop killing civilians. Well, the, the reasons for the stalemate and the increased um, capacity of the Taliban and ISIS is multiple. Um, for one thing, the uh, U.S. and the Afghan government are killing many civilians. The Afghan military and police, which are largely trained by the U.S. and our allies, aren't doing a great job either. So the Afghan government doesn't look credible. In addition, uh, the Afghan government has not been able to provide services to people in Afghanistan. And when they don't provide services, but the Taliban does, then people say, OK, yes. fine, we're with them. Yeah. No, it makes sense. And that's the problem. And it's been going on for so long. Stephen, as Nita's report showed, the Trump administration's relaxation of the rules of engagement coincided with a 95% increase in civilians killed by the US and allied forces. How is it, Stephen, that Trump is still seen by many on the right and even some on the left as some sort of anti-interventionist dove, someone who's against US militarism? You've written, quote, he's not some hero for ending wars. He's not. And the irony is, he's not even ending those wars. Yeah, look, I mean, I think Donald Trump is a con man. We, we know this about Donald Trump. Being surprised by the fact that Donald Trump is doing one thing and saying another, at this point, it, no one should be surprised by that. The reality is, in every theater of combat that he inherited, he poured gasoline on the fire. And now that he's some in some of those places le pouring less gasoline on the fire, he somehow wants credit for putting the fire out. It is absurd that Donald Trump is trying to pretend that he is an anti-war candidate, that he's some sort of anti-war hero. We have to separate that from the question of whether or not continuing to try to win wars that cannot be won on the battlefield but is, is a mistake. It is not a mistake to bring troops home from these wars. It is not a mistake to bring troops off of a battlefield that there is no military solution for. That's a good thing. But we ought to be clear exactly as you said, Donald Trump isn't ending these wars. He's not doing that. He's bringing some troops home. And in most cases, he's not even bringing them home. He's repositioning them to other countries. It's not entirely clear, for instance, in Somalia, that we'll be doing anything differently than what we've been doing. We'll just be bombing, perhaps, from other countries, as we've been doing for years from Djibouti. Uh, it may be off, off, you know, kind of off, yeah. off the coast from Kenya. So we really, we really need to stop this farce. And, and, and in terms of changing things, whether things change, obviously there's a change of president coming up. You wrote in a 2017 tweet, uh, you're going to see a lot of folks denouncing Trump, but basically calling for the same military first policy. Uh, fast forward to 2021, we're going to have a Biden presidency. Uh, Politico is reporting today that Biden intends to appoint retired General Lloyd Austin as his uh, defense secretary, as his Pentagon chief, with Tony Blinken, another man with a great interventionist record, as his secretary of state. Do you worry that we're going to see a continuation of that military first approach? 
It's, it's always a little alarming to see a tweet from 2017 and, and be reminded that it's still prescient today. I do think, look, I think anyone who's paid attention to the last several decades of U.S. foreign policy has to be concerned that we haven't learned the fundamental lesson that we cannot bomb our way to peace. We have been bombing and at war in Afghanistan and Iraq for decades now, in Somalia for decades now. We've been bombing and at war in Yemen for decades now. It has not worked. The folks who are being named to these cabinet positions so far, and I should say the jury's still out, but so far we are seeing folks who've been there for a long time, right? We shouldn't be surprised that folks close to Biden, that Biden is picking folks close to him. He's staffing his administration. The question's going to be, what lessons have they learned? What lessons have they taken away from the failures of the last several decades? What lessons have they taken away about the limits of U.S. military power? What lessons have they taken away about just the, what is so horribly wrong about trying to win wars that cannot be won on the battlefield? Have they learned those lessons? Are they looking for change? I think that's going to be the question before us. And if I might and does the fact, Stephen, that a general is back in charge of the Pentagon... Uh, Nita, I'll bring you in one moment. I just want to get Stephen's take specifically on Lloyd Austin. I know you're someone who's uh, lobbied and, you know, has, has campaigned uh, with the Democratic Party on progressive foreign policy. Does it bother you that a general's being, in charge of the, being put in charge of the Pentagon again, as with Jim Mattis under Trump, no civilian control of the Pentagon again? Yeah, I mean, look, we raised this objection under Donald Trump when he appointed Jim Mattis, as you said. We are alarmed by the, we, we are concerned about the possibility of another general being required to be given a waiver. You know, there's a law here for a reason. I think it's going to be beholden if he is, in fact, the nominee for him to address that concern throughout his nomination process, for him to answer questions. You know, okay. he was obviously a com commander of CENTCOM in charge of these wars. That doesn't tell us okay. what his positions are. In the positions where he'd be a civilian leader, what are his positions? We're going to have to find out. Indeed. Anita, one last question to you. A few years ago, I interviewed retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett, a former coalition spokesman in Iraq. And when I asked him about civilian deaths in Iraq, he told me we got out of the body count business years ago. Isn't that part of the problem, that the government isn't keeping track of civilians that they kill? Shouldn't they be doing what you're doing, Nita? Actually, they do keep count of the civilians that they kill, but they have a different way of accounting. The United Nations does a much better job of accounting for civilian deaths in Afghanistan. And uh, they've been doing it quite well since 2008. And they show a higher number of civilians killed and injured. But if I might, let's go back to the question of, of a chance yeah. that we might have here. Briefly, because we're almost out of time. We've got 20 right, seconds to, left. To, go for it. To reform the U.S. foreign policy, because the United States is much less dependent on Persian Gulf oil, we could gr greatly reduce the military presence in the Middle East. And that seems to, to me to be a high priority. They could rethink instead of going back to legacy forces and legacy policies. Uh, it's a very good point, and I hope they do, and I hope this new administration listens to people like yourself and Stephen Miles. We appreciate you both taking time out to come on the show. Thank you so much.